Good morning, everybody. The feng shui of the church is thrown off because the, the holidays are sitting now on this side. So, yeah, the park is not right through everybody off. What is going on here? Straight lines? Good morning, online, so you don't have to work and deal with the parking lot this morning. But uh, no, I think it'll be really great. It opens up a ton more parking for us. And uh, the other thing, if you don't, if you don't experience our Tuesday pantry, um, it's automatic. You know, having the cones that way is much easier enough for us to put the cones in the the order that we need them for the for the people coming through. So we'll give it a shot. Um, we're going to post uh, Brent's phone number if you don't have it. Up on the screen. He wants any of your feedback between midnight and 3 a.m. Uh, that's his prime working hour. So um, no, it's it's good to see everybody this morning. Say hi to your neighbor. We're so happy to see you. We're going to get started. First, we're going to pray and. Just welcome the Holy Spirit to come and, you know, just, I don't know if it's anything like, like, it's been kind of tough for the team this morning we got together and it's like, whoa, you know, it's just a heaviness, I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's just kind of heavy, so we just want to welcome the freshness of the Holy Spirit to come and wherever you're at and whatever's going on, that it's just kind of rejuvenating. So come Holy Spirit, we pray. We just ask that you uh, meet us. Meet us in the things this morning that uh, maybe have been challenges this week or even victories this week. In the depths of our heart that we've cried out. And, um, let us know that you're there. Let's not leave here this morning without being changed. Just work in those areas. And let us rejoice and just be, be glad. Let us have joy this morning for who you are and your love and your grace and your kindness to each and every one of us. So we thank you. So as we lift our voices, as we uh, open our hearts and our ears for what you have to say, let us just corporately uh, worship you and just rejoice for who you are in our lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you feel like standing, you can stand. We'll put the words up on the screen. And um, Yeah, this is uh, our form of worship with music.
to be quote of the day better than Facebook.
blessing. Um, God, I see the blessings, but if I have to give up all those blessings to have my time with you, my moment with you, to be in your presence, God, I'll give away all those blessings, and I'll give away everything that I own to be with you. And I just pray that over us this morning. Sometimes we can get caught up in that. I wish I had. I wish I did. But God is so faithful. And to be in the mindset to say, God, I give away everything I own if I get time with you today. To have a relationship with you today. So God, we thank you for your presence this morning. For your presence every morning. We thank you for the breath in our lungs. And even for the empty hands that we get to raise to you and say, God, help me. And this is what I can give to you today. So we thank you and we praise you. Good morning, church. I want to welcome all of you and those on Facebook uh, to the Vineyard Community Church. Uh, we are a church of we are a church that that loves people and uh, loves God, and we do our very best. And we offer God our very best to be His people uh, here in Wycliffe and beyond. So, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you could join us here at the Vineyard and all of you at home. We are live streaming on Sunday, our Sunday services on Facebook, and uh, later in the week it shows up also on YouTube. Uh, we are continuing a sermon series, The Ten Words Plus One, and Pastor Brent's, uh, Brent Paulson's message today is called Number Ten, Crave, or I Can't Get No Satisfaction. <clears throat> Sounds like a Brent sermon, doesn't it? All right. Uh, our scripture for today is Exodus 20, verse 17. Uh, grab your Bible or cell phone to follow today's text. You'll also find it printed in your bulletin. Are you new here today? Or are you new here any time in, in recently? Uh, come to the meet and greet today, uh, June 26th. Join for a few minutes following this service to ask questions and hear more about our church. Look for Pastor Jim, who was playing the guitar right there. He's not there now. Um, and uh, look for him in the fellowship hall uh, for a brief time of meet and greet. Also today, on uh, June 26th, today, uh, there's a concert in the park this evening. Relax and watch the sunset over Lake Erie with the Ron Sluga Trio featuring our own Ron Sluga. Bring lawn chairs and maybe something to munch on or a beverage to sip, and listen to some, some of your favorite songs at the Lakefront Lodge, 30525 Lakeshore Boulevard in Willowick. 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. tonight. It's free. Uh, so that'll be a great time. Remember that next Sunday, July 3rd, the Sunday service will be the drive-in parking lot service. Uh, we're, we're doing those on the holidays uh, when we can, when weather allows. 
You can tune in on your car radio, turn on your air conditioning, and listen from your car, or you can roll your windows down and let the, let the breezes and the sound flow in. Uh, bring a lawn chair or a sun hat and a friend. Uh, and then on a personal note, next uh, fr Sunday also, in the evening at 6.30 p.m., the Brass Band of the Western Reserve, which is a 35-piece English-style brass band of which I've been a member for uh, 25 years, almost 25 years. Uh, they are doing a concert at uh, Hudson on the Green in Hudson, Ohio. It'll be a great concert um, and uh, should be a great evening. And if you can make that, I think you'll have a great time. Uh, Saturday, July 9th, the barbecue rib cookout here at the church. It's, it's, it's food, <laughs> Zane. It, it, and it's all, Zane, Zane will eat a lot, I, I'm convinced. It's Christmas in July, a CFK fundraiser. Uh, there will be a basket auction, family fun and games, 50-50 raffle, front yard in the of the vineyard from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Complete rib dinner is a bargain at $15 while supplies last. Kids meals are free with an adult dinner. Uh, and then, don't forget today's offering. We have a small table at the back of the sanctuary, and I added to this. We have a small table at the back of the sanctuary for your big offering. <clears throat> or you can donate on the church website or Facebook. Um, and so that's it. Uh, it's a great morning to be alive. It's a great morning to be in the presence of God. It's a great morning to be at the vineyard. And uh, it's a great morning to hear Brent's sermon, which is coming up next. Can't, I can't even operate a cup holder. That's really bad. Poor Tans. Wonderful things for the sermon. Um, good morning. It's good to be back. Teresa and I were on vacation for a couple weeks to upper the UP, Michigan. Uh, saw my brother in Mercer, Wisconsin, which was awesome. My brother and sister-in-law spent some time up there. Beautiful country. Horrible mosquitoes. It was awesome. I um, want to give a shout out, too, for all the women who were involved in the women's ministry yesterday. We had a great, I stopped in for a minute. It was a great turnout yesterday. Lots and lots of, lots of women, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, this morning we're going to uh, deal with the last, well, it's actually the last of the Ten Commandments, but we're doing one more, too, plus one. We're doing the plus one. Um, and as many of you know, there's been... Um, well, as all of you probably know, there's a, been a shift in our in our country regarding um, abortion, Roe versus Wade, that kind of thing. And I want to encourage us as a community, wherever you're coming from on that, is that we have always, our hearts have always been to support and love people through what they're going through. And so if you or you know somebody who's in a crisis pregnancy, please let us know so we can help, so we can come alongside, support, love, um, do all that because that's I think part of what we're going to be called to do through this whole you know dishevelment and craziness in our in our world right now and so again I would encourage us to just be praying and if you know any women if you know any people that are in crisis pregnancy you know let's come alongside I was part of a organization many years ago it's called Alternatarian that used to help women in crisis pregnancies um, who wanted to keep their, their child. It helped provide the medical services and the home services and all that stuff that they needed. So, um, But this morning, I'm going to start out actually with a video that we're talking about covetousness today. It's a great subject. It's your first time. It's awesome. You know, coveting um, covers pretty much everything. But I want to start out with this. Now i gotta, I got to give a caveat, caveat, caveat to this. To begin with, um, that it's possible that if you're watching online, 
that this might get zorched out for a couple minutes. So if it goes silent for a couple minutes, hang in there. We'll be right back because sometimes um, copyright things do weird stuff when we try and play a video. But we're going to do it anyway, right? I would say, what is it? Um, the old uh, military saying, damn the torpedoes are full speed ahead, right? Yeah. Can I say that? Oh, I did. Sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's sad, sad for, Steve. sad for Steve Martin, isn't it? That the reason he got into that, if you watch the whole movie, sometimes it's called the jerk. Is that anyway? He invents something that gets him a lot of money, changes his life, and uh, ends up there. But the the point I wanted to m make in that is that that's that's all I need. That's all I need. What is all you need? this morning. What is all you need? We're going to talk about covetousness. And um, again, the title is I Can't Get No Satisfaction. What is, what is covetousness? What does it mean? What does it mean to be covet covetous? Um, ultimately, covetousness is an inordinate love for something other than God. It's making something less it's making less important things ultimate. So covetousness, um, as St. Augustine said, was, was um, when the, the love in our life gets disordered. When things that, that should be on the lower end of the love scale go up high and things that are up high go low. I mean, Teresa and I in our marriage once in a while will talk about like where are we putting each other on a scale of one to ten in our in our relationship. And obviously both of us want 
the other one to be number, I want her to be number one and I want to be her number one, right? In a marriage. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And sometimes that causes major problems in a marriage. In, um, in Minnesota, where Dave and Shannon pastored for five years, four years, five years. By the way, raise your hands or stand up or something. That's Dave and Shannon Welker. Longtime members of the community. I think, I think some of, maybe both of you came to know Jesus here. At least one of you did. Um, so they've been part of our community for a long time. Dave was on staff for a little while, and then he helped start a church on the west side. Then he went to Minnesota to pastor a church. Made it through five winters and said, that's it. We're just, we're done. Um, but, um, you know, we can, we can make anything. We can covet over anything. <coughs> Excuse me. We can covet work. We can covet money. We can covet sex. We can covet food. The, the, the list of things that we can covet is, is almost inexhaustible. Um, in fact, the things that we do covet. And if you look at Augustine's view of of what covetousness is, that it's disordered love. It's putting things that aren't necessarily bad. Houses aren't bad. Cars aren't bad. Even money's not, not inherently bad. It can be used for all kinds of good, right? I mean, I know a lot of wealthy people that are just do amazingly good things with their money. So none of those things are inherently bad, but they can become bad, and they do become bad in our lives when they get out of order. And one of the reasons I think that the God or Moses put this in as the last word in his words on how a society should be framed. By the way, the ten, these are called the ten words in scripture. We call them the ten commandments, ten words. They're basically supposed to be a structure for a, a, a life of faith. In fact, one writer writes this. They're, they're to structure how we live, what our lives look like, what Israel's life look like. These seemingly secular laws are informed by a lively concern for certain rights and duties for the sake of the good order of the community. They're done for the sake of the community, not just us. This represents the work of God, the Creator, in shaping the communal life. This section is also important in the formulation of these laws that they correspond more closely to the laws of human societies through the ages. Throughout all the ages, these have become kind of a cornerstone on which societies often, not always, are built. The temptation for such societies will be to separate their legal structures and procedures from the presence and activities of God. This section in Exodus insists that even such details are part and parcel of God's creative work for the sake of good order in every nook and cranny in the world. In other words, it's God's part of his work in bringing heaven to earth. What do we pray for? We pray for, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does that look like? It looks like people who aren't coveting other people's stuff or coveting stuff. In this respect, these laws are an extension of God's work as creator in Genesis 1. God, through the law, fosters and establishes creational rightness and justice in all relationships. Life in Israelite society is intended to be a microcosm of the life of creation as God originally intended it. And that's how we are to live up. That's why we're, our lives are ultimately, when Jesus comes into us, part of what he's trying to do is reorder the loves in our life. He's, he gives us new life. He gives us a new heart. But he also is trying to to reorder those parts of our loves and our lives that get disordered. And they get really disordered sometimes, don't they? Somebody compared it to um, the, the Lord of the Rings. I, I, one of my f just all-time funniest favorite things that happened in our church once was some of you know Lord of the Rings when it first came out. How many of you have ever seen Lord of the Rings? It's like... It's a pretty amazing epic movie. They actually did a really good job. I was a fan of the book way back in high school. And um, when the movie came out, I thought, oh, it's not going to be great. But it ended up being really good. And so 
um, one of our staff members, whose name is Jim, um, had never seen it. And so another staff member, who's, who's no, no longer here, Chris, had the DVDs. I remember when they had these things called DVDs? They're these little round things. They had like data on them and they show, and you put them in this magic machine and they magically the picture came on. Um, but anyway, so, so they borrowed Jim the DVDs. Well, Jim didn't realize it, but they were in the, in the little box, the DVD box, in the wrong order. So they had the first one, then the third one, and then the second one. And so Jim comes back and I asked him, well, what did you think? Did you like um, The Lord of the Rings? He goes, yeah, I just don't get why, what the big, why did they even do the third movie? I mean, they already destroyed the ring. Sorry. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, they already destroyed the ring, and then they spend this whole rest of their time trying to not let the ring get it. I don't get it. And I go, and I'm going, what? What are you talking about? And then it took a, to dawn on me after a few minutes, like, dude, you watched the last two backwards. You know, you watch the last two backwards. But that's not my point. That was just fun to share with everybody. Um, the point being that part of what, uh, when, when J.R.R. Tolkien was asked what this was about, somebody asked, I think it was a young lady wrote to him and asked him once, what was this about? And he said, it's about idolatry in society. He said, he said that ring, <laughs> and I've been having swelling hands, so I don't have my wedding ring on. Um, but anyway, uh, he said that ring, uh, the guy whose ring it was, was Sauron. And he endued that ring with so much power, all of his power, that whoever had it would, would, would have kind of all this power. In fact, it, it so corrupted people that would, would wear it. There was a guy in there named Gollum. I'm giving away the whole movie if you haven't seen it. But anyway, um, there's a guy in there named Gollum who's, who, um, had worn it so long that he'd gotten addicted, basically totally addicted to it, and he called it, it had become part of him. And he called it my precious. My precious. And so when it wasn't with him, he, his life was completely disordered. And Sauron, the, the power, you know, the person in this whole thing, his whole life was in, in, endued and, and centered in this thing. And so when it was destroyed, his life was destroyed. And one of the reasons God tells us not to covet, not to be covetous, is because he knows that if we disorder our love, if we put our love in the wrong things, it's like putting all of our, our everything, all of our hopes and dreams and plans in that one ring. And when that one ring gets destroyed, guess what happens? Our lives just crash and burn. And so God is saying, I don't want your lives to crash and burn. I, I made you for one thing and one thing only. And, and, and I made you with, with a hole in your heart the size of me that only I can fill. That's what God would say. And when that gets disordered, we live in anxiety. We live in fear. If money is, is our first love, you know, what, what happens when the stock market crashes? That's why during the Great Depression, you saw literally saw people leaping off buildings when the stock market crashed because that's where all their money was. But the problem was that that's where all, where all their money was. That's where their treasure was. They had disordered love in their life. Their love was so disordered that when that thing was taken away, and I believe God allows that to happen sometimes, their life was crushed. Now for many of us, like in 2001, Teresa and I had some semblance of a retirement back then. And in 2001, it pretty much all got, after the, the um, crash into the towers, um, we pretty much lost most of our retirement. We, didn't ha we had it with a, one of the big companies, Fidelity, but for whatever reason, most of that just went away. And it was kind of a bummer. It was like, oh, that, that's not fun. Now I'm going to now you're, now you're gonna have to pass her until 95 and a half. But um, not necessarily. But the reality was that it didn't destroy our lives. We were just like, oh, that's, that's, well, I won't say what I said. But anyway. And then what was really funny in that whole process is, is, is the company which I already said was Fidelity, so sorry, sorry Fidelity, because they're a good company. But um, they, they, had some, they got some young intern to call everybody up, because we had, you know, an okay amount of money in there. 
before 9-11. And all of a sudden, I get this call, and it was this young guy from Fidelity. And he's like, Mr. Paulson, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, I need to call you because we're going to have to start charging you for your re retirement account. And I said, why? And he said, because you've dro dropped below our $2,000 minimum. And I'm like, so you lost my money, and now you're going to charge me for losing my money? And this poor, poor kid is going, I am, I am, I am. <laughs> like, but you know what? Again, it, it didn't destroy us. Why? Because that wasn't the most important thing in our lives. Covetousness is something, it's an inordinate love for something other than God. It's making less important things ultimate. There's a great story in the Bible in 1 Kings where there's a king named Nabal, or Naboth. And Naboth is king, he's king of Israel, and his neighbor has this garden that he likes. He wants the garden. In the, in the neighbors, he goes, I'll pay you whatever you want, you know, do whatever you want, I'll give you another garden somewhere else. And the neighbor, because it had been in his family, and we don't understand this, but in Israel kind of tradition or in Israel culture, the land that God gave you was the pr part of the promise from God for your life. And so to give up that land wasn't just like, oh, I'm just greedy, I'm going to hang on to it. It was like, no, this is giving up part of the promise of God, so no, I just don't feel comfortable doing it. Well, Naboth went into a, he had a, he had a fit, you know, he had a tantrum. And his wife um, said, what, you know, what's going on? He said, or as Ab I'm sorry, as Ab Ahab was, was the king and Naboth was the one who had the garden. And um, Ahab asked him, you know, Jezebel's wife came and asked him, what's wrong? And she said, he said, you know, well, this is what's going on. And she said, well, let me take care of it. So basically she did, and she ended up having this guy killed, and then the garden became his. Well, that's a great example of coveting your neighbor's land, isn't it? Where it became so important to him that he wasn't even able to sleep. He was so worried about having this. Now, coveting isn't always bad. By the way, if you're OCD, this is really a challenging thing because we tend to fix, I'm OCD, we tend to fixate on everything no matter what it is. And so, and that's not the same as necessarily having disordered love. Sometimes that's just um, needing to have help or medication or whatever. Because sometimes if you're OCD, you get fixated on things all the time. And so... There's a, there's a difference there. I, I want to point that out. But coveting is not always bad. It's not bad to desire things. It's not bad to desire to be married. Some of you want to be married that aren't married, and that's okay. It can become unokay if you begin feeling like, if this doesn't happen, I will die. Some, <laughs> I used to make a joke, and it was sort of half a joke. It was that, that you know most of the single people in church, their one desire is to be married. And for some of the married people in church, their one desire is to be single. And so it's not always true, but there's some reality in that. And so be careful what you wish for sometimes. Not in my case. I love being married. I need to qualify that. It's like I'm standing here going, I should just shut up now. I should just shut up. It's, it's, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Um, but anyway, so it, it's not always a bad thing. In fact, David said this. He says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, and my whole being longs for you. In a dry and weary land, in parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory because your love is better than life. I, I love what Kaylee said this morning. You actually quoted my sermon. You could have just finished it right there. Your love is better than life. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands, and I will be fully satisfied with the richest of foods. With the singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I will be so fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. As with the richest of foods. Are you fully satisfied in God? Now, I have to acknowledge that I'm, I'm not always. I'm not always. 
Just being real. We live in a society where we're bombarded with reasons we shouldn't be satisfied. You know, literally Mick Jagger was right. I can't get no satisfaction. Our whole society, all of capitalism is built on the idea that we need we need more and and we want more and and it's and, and there's a good part again, there's nothing wrong inherently with with having things, but when you're told continually that that you really can't be happy unless you have this car or unless you have this house or unless you have this that you really can't be satisfied. You will go on chasing the wind the rest of your life. And so, like I said before, in Luke 12, um, Jesus gives a great, again, a great example of, of the, the danger of covetousness. And, and Jesus says this in Luke 12. He says, um, he, somebody comes up to him during, during a funeral and said, hey, somebody's died. Tell my brother to share his inheritance with me. You know, and that sounds kind of weird, like in the middle of a funeral, somebody going, hey, I want the inheritance. Oh my gosh, it's not. I have literally needed a referee outfit some, at some funerals I've been at. Because there's, I mean, I've, I've been at funerals where there's been fist fights out in the parking lot. Why? Because, you know, grandma or mom left the ring, and I wanted this ring, and you took this ring, and da 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 And it's like, you know, it gets to the point like when, when neither of our parents had anything. So when they died, we we're kind of like, we we're all just like, you know, what would you like? You know, what kind of mementos would you like to remember them by? And there's some benefit. Do you, do you ever realize there's a blessing sometimes? In fact, in being poor? Bible, I think, even says something like that. Blessed are the poor. I mean, when's the last time you heard that? Oh, yes, you're blessed when you get everything you want. You're really rich and you're powerful. Why does he say blessed are the poor? Because, first of all, because we, we, we learn a healthy dependence on God. One of the dangers of wealth, there's a proverb that talks about this. Lord, help me not to be so rich that I forget about you, but help me not to be so poor that I'm tempted to go steal either. But it, 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 it helps us realize our, our, our need for God. There's something good about that. We tend to forget about it when everything is fine. We forget that where stuff comes from. And so, what do we do? What do we do? How do we overcome covetousness? How do we overcome this thing? In our, how do we get put the pieces back in order? How do we put our loves back in order? Well, first of all, if, if, if you're trying to live this whole thing out as just a moral thing, like, okay, I'll, I'll just try really hard not to covet. Good luck with that. You know, I, I learned early on in... in uh, with one of my first loves, which was alcohol and drugs, I learned that it, it, it covetousness is, is, is powerful. It's a sin, and sin is powerful. It's big. And it was too big for me, and I couldn't overcome it myself. And I needed help. I had to realize that, that my disordered love in my life had made my life just a huge mistake. My whole life was disordered and was fraying at the seams because the, the, the number one love in my life was alcohol. And I would do anything for the love in my life. I stole. I cheated. I lied. Things that I would just never do. I thought I would never do that. And I did. And the good thing that came out of that is that I realized how broken I was and I realized that, that I needed a Savior. And again, I was trying to fill my heart with something that God never intended. Is it wrong to have a glass of wine? No. Is it wrong to have a beer? No. They're, they're lovely things. In fact, it says in, the Prover in Proverbs that wine makes the heart merry. Or maybe it's in the Psalms. I can't remember. Wine makes the heart merry, except for those of us who are alcoholics. And then wine makes the heart out of control and, dis and really dysfunctional. Um, so, so we need to get a new heart. Ezekiel said, for I will take out 
you out of the nations, and this is God speaking to you, and I will gather you from the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Some of you this morning here need God's fresh water sprinkled on you. I should have brought one of those things they do in the Catholic Church where they go like this, you know. Or I could have just got a super soaker. Just soaked you all. We need to be cleansed sometimes, don't we? Don't we need a cleansing sometimes? I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I'll, I'll heal you. And I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. There's a great passage that David quotes in Psalm 51. I don't have it up here, so don't, don't try and find it, Dave. But in Psalm 51, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, talk about covet. Look at how dangerous this thing is. By the way, coveting encompasses every other. If you can begin to get that order back in your life, basically it's the same as the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me, right? It's the same as the first. What he does, it's brilliant writing. God's a brilliant writer, do you know that? It's the last, the last words are the same as the first, basically. Don't have any other gods before me. And if we do that, all the other things fall into place. If, if we're not coveting something, we're not going to go rob somebody. If we're not coveting something, we're not going to go com commit adultery. If we're not, do you get it? They are, all the rest of them fall into place. This is a biggie. It was the one that, that Paul helped Paul realize that he was fallen and broken. Why? Because it wasn't just something you could check off a list. Paul went through his life and said, you know, as for the commandments, I kept them all. You know, and we go, wow, nobody can keep all of them, can they? Paul was like, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't murder anybody. I didn't steal anything. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. And sometimes we don't even feel like we covet our neighbors anything. But I think really deep down we begin to realize, no, I've got some disordered love in my life. Find contentment in God's provision. Hebrews 13 says, Keep your loves free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Sometimes our drive for more and more is because we just never feel secure. By the way, this, this is where, I mean, over the years we've you know, ran into challenges with money and sometimes spent more than we have and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that stuff can come down to covet, covetousness too, can't it? where we just feel like, well, I need to have this because everybody else has it. Consider God's provision for you. In the, in the passage, there's a great passage where Jesus talks about a man who, who has all kinds of stuff and he, he has a great harvest and he says, what should I do with this great harvest? I've been given abundance and even more. What should I do with it? I know what I'll do. I'll build a beggar barn. And store it up. You know, if God gives you abundance, you know what he gives you abundance for sometimes? It's not to build a bigger barn. To give it away. I lived, <laughs> this, this is true. My, my parents, when I was growing up, my dad became the president of this pretty big machine shop. It was a Fortune 500 company. It had about 250 employees. They still lived, at that time, they still lived in the house they bought for $9,000. Guess what my parents did with it? All, and they, I mean, they had it remodeled and stuff like that, but they still lived there. Guess what they did with all that extra money? They gave it away. They gave it away. My parents died with nothing. But they died with everything. They were so rich. And that brings me to my next point, that we need to get a new purse. We've got bad purses. Don't be afraid, little flock. This, by the way, this all comes... Oh, the, by the way, that guy that's, that builds the bigger barns, and Jesus says, he's using it in the context of coveting, and he says... Um, 
you fool, this very night your, your soul will be cry, required of you. And what will happen to all of your stuff? What's going to happen to it? Well, I don't know. There's probably relatives that are going to fight over it. He says, don't, and, and you know, part of, part of this, especially when it comes to finances and, and money and stuff, some of it can come from this over, and this I believe is a word for some of you, can come from this fear of not having that somehow I don't have a Heavenly Father. I remember when I was brand new Christian and we went to this small group in a house. By the way, if you're not in a small group, get involved in one. They're really cool. That's how I first learned about Jesus. And um, I'm in this small group and, and it was taught some of, the, some of the teachers at Bethel Seminary and College would teach it. And one of the art teachers came in, and he came in with a bunch, a couple birdhouses, and the birdhouses were stuffed to the gills with, with food. I mean, they were, they were so full. And then he brought a little bird, a little fake bird. I hope it was fake. I hope he didn't kill it. I don't know. But anyway, I had this bird, and he's, his whole message, I still remember it. This is how much it hit me. I still remember it. He's like going, He's trying to get the bird in the house, and the bird won't fit in the house. Why? Go on, go on YouTube sometime. Look up Madam Blueberry from uh, Veggie Tales. Great, great lesson on coveting. But get a new purse. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Your father's pleased to give you stuff in the kingdom of God. He's pleased to give you healing. He's pleased to, to use, to have you pray for somebody who's sick. He's pre pleased to do that. And he's pleased to, to take care of us. God is so taken care of Teresa and I all of our lives. I've, I've shared with you again and again how we, we, don't, we don't suffer. God has been so kind to us. He gets us, you, you might see us, I'm drive, driving around. Teresa's got a convertible BMW, BMW motorcycle. You go, wow, they must be really rich. No, I, I've just found really good deals on them. God's, God gave them to us for super, super cheap. Therese, I won't tell you exactly how much, but Teresa's, that, that BMW convertible was under $10,000. So if you drive by it and look at it, man, look at it, man, you must make a lot of money. It's like, no, well, you can, I'll share my salary with you sometime if you want, but it's not a lot. I mean, it's plenty, but it's not a lot. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Disordered love. Where your treasure is, there goes your heart. Is it wrong to desire things? No. Is it wrong to want things? No. Is it wrong to get a house? No. Is it wrong to get a car? No. Is it wrong to be excited about it? No. Depends on where it is, where it is in the order of your life. If that is your life, then it's a problem. Then you've placed everything in a ring of power or a ring of whatever. And once it's destroyed, so are you. You need to do whatever it takes. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature. Now, it's interesting here, because he does the things that we usually think about. You know, earthly, sexual immorality, okay, yeah. Impurity, yeah. Lust, evil desires, and greed. And the term greed there is covetousness. Isn't that interesting? Sexual imp impurity, covetousness. Puts him in the same batch. You know, and receive God's smile for you. Number six says, God bless you and keep you. God's smile, this tree said, read this yesterday as a devotion. God smile on you. God look you full in the face and make you prosper. And I'll just finish up with um, Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 12. Because in the beginning passage that, that I read, I don't even know if I read the passage. Did I read the passage? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's things. And then at the end of that, he said, that at the end of that whole passage, God is speaking to the people, and the people go, we're terrified. We're terrified of the voice of God. We're terrified of seeing God. We're terrified of hearing from God. 
Moses, from now on, you just intercede for us. We can't handle this. It's too much for us. And there's a beautiful change in that in Hebrews 12. Because Mo the writer in Hebrews 12 is specifically writing about Exodus 20, and he says, You have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched, and that is burning with fire to gloom and to darkness and gloom and storming to a trumpet blast or such a voice that the such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg no further word be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. That isn't the mountain we've come to. You've come to Mount Zion through Jesus' death and resurrection to the city of the living God. We've come to a different mountain. The heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Did you know when Jesus comes into your life, he writes your name in heaven. You don't need to be afraid anymore, little flock. I love he says, do not be afraid, little flock. We're just little. We're little. It's good to be little. I feel like some of you need to realize you're little and it's okay for you to let your papa, your heavenly father, be big. You're trying to fit in his shoes and they don't fit. You ever try and wear your dad's shoes? It doesn't work. You've come to thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And may that sprinkled blood and that new mountain we come to take our fears away, reorder our hearts, or in some cases give us a new heart. Or as David said, renew, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Father, I feel like you're doing a bunch of stuff today. I feel like there's some people who have been feeling like they have to fill the shoes of the Father. They've been stumbling around in life. I feel like for some, they don't want this to be, they don't want their lives to be disordered anymore. We're like alcoholics, Lord, that our lives have become unmanageable. We need a power greater than ourselves to restore us to sanity. And Jesus, you are that power that can restore us. So would you come, let your power come right now, Jesus, and begin to restore people. Begin to restore and reorder hearts. Begin to touch people. Touch people's feet with the good news of the gospel. Touch people's hands. There's some people with some hand issues. I pray that you touch them right now. I pray for some somebody has been just confused and disoriented and God wants to come and heal. And some people feel like there's something going wrong even in their head and God wants to heal. And somebody, some of you maybe have just found out, maybe there's some woman here who's found out you have some, some breast cancer issues and God wants to bring healing to that. He wants to be your papa. He wants to be your father. He wants to be the good God. And for many of us, myself included, we just need God to reorder our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to have an opportunity just to pray. And if you want to sit where you are, you can pray. If you want to come up, you can pray. If you need to go, that's fine. We set up a new parking thing. If I hear of 10 crashes out there, we'll know it's not working. So be careful when you back up. You have to back up today. But come on and just receive the grace, God's grace today, okay? God bless.